state of the Washington blueberry industry where I put in numbers, production, projection, conjecture, and let's get started. So the Blueberry Commission was formed in 1969. It makes it uh, one of the oldest commodity commissions in the state. Our commissioners are Brian Sakuma, who is chair, um, Adam Enfield, Brent Roy, Todd Van Mersbergen, Rob Dollywall, Leif Olson, and our Department of Ag rep is Rebecca Weber. Um, the blueberry industry that we are kind of overseeing is in the midst of a dramatic period of change, and I've been saying it for seven years, and it is true every year, and you will see some information here that will support this. Almost the whole rest of the talk is supporting that uh, third bullet point. And the commission is trying to develop some programming activities to deal with the change that we're going through. I want to take a minute and talk about the 2017 season. We started out saying that there was going to be 140 million pounds, and that was based on the fact that a lot of new acres had gone in, there was minimal winter injury, and things looked pretty good. And then pollination happened, and we dialed it back to 130 million pounds. By July, we saw what happened to the Duke harvest, and we dialed it back another 5 million to 125 million. And then we saw that in Eastern Washington, particularly, I mean, Western Washington, particularly in Whatcom County, particularly the Duke harvest was down. And so we, uh, when it got to October, I said, I had to get up and say what we think our production is going to be in front of the whole industry at uh, North American Blueberry Council meeting. And so I said 120 million pounds, which is what I said last year, which mean for the first time since I've been running the Blueberry Commission, 2006, that we would have been flat. <clears throat> However, uh, there is a lot of fruit that's coming on and contributing to production. Even though some growers were down, there was a lot of new fruit coming on. But I'm gonna tell you, Washington did not produce near what it could have produced had everything gone right. But overall, it wasn't a bad season in terms of production. So we actually do not know the final tally. Um, the assessments are legally due the end of October, but we don't penalize people until after November 30th. And uh, a lot of growers are waiting to the last minute to pay assessments. Um, we have, uh, we've collected on 70 million. Um, I know there's at least at least 40 million uh, pounds of assessment money coming in theoretically in the next two or three or four four days. Um, I know that there's over two million pounds that we just can't seem to collect um, collect on. But right now I am projecting 120 million pounds. I don't know if we're going to make it there. Um, it, it might be lower, but I'll, I should know by the end of the year. The more interesting story, Daryl, it's a little early to start raising your hand. So, but what, what do you got, Daryl? Late variety of, of uh, blueberries. And so really, I don't know what I'm going to have until really almost the 1st of October. Uh, but I'm getting these assessment papers uh, two months ahead of time. And so a lot of times it gets lost in the shuffle. Uh, uh, not, uh, I mean, but, but my, the company, Barry Hill, will end up paying uh, uh, because they're taking it out of my funds and, and sending it over to you anyway. Was there a point in there, Daryl? Uh, the point was that maybe uh, the, the uh, uh, assessment papers uh, come out a little bit early uh, uh, and before people really know where the hell they're at. Um, so I have a couple slides that kind of talk about something like that in that it's a little difficult kind of managing this industry. In 2016, the first berries were harvested on May 30th. We need to have our assessment forms out 
um, with for folks that are, you know, if you're Eastern Washington Duke, you're done by July 15th or July 20th. So we send them out towards the beginning of harvest, and then we send periodic reminders out with this. And you can always go to our website and get your forms from the website. So what I take away from your comment is just that you're disorganized, Daryl. Okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, look at, someone's laughing a little too hard over there. Um, so, so I'm going to point out what other states are projecting. If you look at Michigan, right, Michigan is, had 88 million, is what they're projecting, down 12 million. British Columbia projected down 25 million. Oregon down 11 million. We're not perhaps as sophisticated as some of these other states, and we just, we're not for sure, so we just stuck in uh, 120 like we did last year. I can't see us getting below 110. I might be surprised if we're up over 120, but we will see. Perhaps the most striking one was Georgia down from 67 million to 26 million. And look, in 2014, Georgia produced 96 million pounds. They are now at about 70% less than what they produced four years ago. And during this time, they have continued to plant. They have just been hit with spring frost year after year after year. And if Georgia ever gets it straight and the weather cooperates with them, they suggest that they will push 120 or 150 million pounds. But they haven't yet. Uh, New Jersey, in 2013 was at 65 million. They're down to 38 million. North Carolina also got hit with some inclement weather, down 25, down to 25 million. California was flat. Florida was up a little bit. Mexico's up a little bit. The interesting thing here is 91 million pounds fewer blueberries were produced in 2017 than in 2016. And if you look through here, Production has always gone up. This is the first time that production has, actually there's one right here. There's, nope, that one up too. So this is the first time that actual blueberry production has declined. What might be as important is there was a 109 million pound reduction in low bush production in North, North America. So there is fewer blueberries around. If you look at the split between processed, for the first time ever, Washington produced more processed blueberries than, than any other location. If you look at what we project, um, fresh went up by 6 million, process went down by 6 million. So we, um, we went 30% uh, fresh, which is the highest percentage fresh that, that we've had. Uh, British Columbia, very strikingly, very strikingly, went from 110 million pounds to 60 million pounds in a year. I don't know how they did that, but that's what uh, they said. Michigan pr produced a process 10 million pounds less this year than last year. Overall, the West Coast produced 197 million pounds. All of North America produced 256 million pounds of processed blueberries. So 77% of all processed blueberries came from the West Coast. That's California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. And overall, we were down 127 million pounds of processed blueberries. And that's why the inventory is short. Shelford, what do you think about that? What's that mean? Price is stable? So what's the inventory now compared to a year ago? What's that? It's down 40 million from where it was this time of last year. So <clears throat> the quite low prices in 2016 for conventional processed blueberries made a lot of growers switch to fresh pack, including a lot of machine harvesting of fresh blueberries. It's going to be interesting to see if this trend continues or even expands. <clears throat> Something that's particularly interesting is British Columbia. If you look what's happened in the last four years, 
The fresh went from 60 to 66, down to 50, with a, but with a striking 50% increase from 50 to 75 million, uh, from 50 to 75 million pounds fresh, and it plummeted 110 to 60 million pounds, almost a 54% de decrease. That is just striking. And again, uh, these aren't my numbers. This is what was provided by the uh, British Columbia Blueberry Council. So the big question is, what about 2018? Who knows? However, I'm going to make a guess. So if we have minimum winter injury, normal pollination, don't have drought, don't have excessive high temperatures, if we have you know, just a, a normal typical year with nothing uh, exceedingly bad, and if, let's say, we have 20, 120 million pounds in 2017, the combination of some improved yields on established fields, because we had a number of fields that were off last year, or this year, and we have a lot of new uh, young fields coming on, we could have a 15% increase in production easily. 138 million, maybe 140 million next year. It's a lot of blueberries. And what if British Columbia goes back to what they did the year before or increase? You know, it'd be nothing for British Columbia to have 185 million pounds of blueberries. What if Oregon goes back to 100 or goes up 10% over a year ago and does 110? What if Michigan goes up to 120? What if Georgia goes up to 120? There's a lot of what ifs, but if most states have a normal production year, there is going to be blueberries next year like we've never seen before. So where's this going? I just want to point out Whatcom County, leading producer of blueberries is over 7,000 acres and it just keeps going up. A quarter of those acres are four years old or younger, which means they're not fully bearing. Midbell, where are you? You're around here somewhere. I said over 7,000. Do you have a more precise number? Close enough? Do you, do you agree with 25% of the acres are four years old or, young, or younger? Yes. Yeah, okay. 25% um, of the acreage in eastern Washington is not at full capacity. Um, they're getting 20 to 25,000 pounds per acre of maturity, even for organic fields. Uh, we are producing a lot of organic berries. This is still growing. They're still planting. Um, if I had to guess, it'd top out at 60 million pounds of organic blueberries. Conventional production is growing too. Snohomish and Skagit are leading with new acres. There's some other counties, both Whatcom and uh, around the Tri-Cities, there's a lot of planting going on. Hey, there's over a thousand acres slated to go in. I know of one planting of 800 acres just north of where I live that's just being groomed and uh, ready to, I'll show you some pictures of it late. 800 acres in, in one planting. Um, we're not close to peaking our production of blueberries. Um, I did some analysis of the assessment data, and I have no idea why this white line is here. I don't know if you can see it, but that's it's percent of production by county. Um, somebody made a comment, somebody who is probably listening from Prosser that was saying that they thought that Eastern Washington was producing half the blueberries in this state. So I thought I would check that out. And so I went and looked at all the assessments that were submitted, and looked at the zip codes, and most of them have zip codes, and sometimes they have zip codes that aren't associated with where the production is, but I, I did a pretty good job, I felt, and this is approximate. I was able to figure out accurate zip codes for 96% of the production, and it's just, it's kind of interesting if you look at where the 31% 31, 31 Benton County uh, look down here at Whatcom, 43.5. If you if you extrapolate this to the hundred to a hundred percent of it, um, Whatcom is probably 44 percent of the blueberries in the state. So 
uh, overwhelmingly, uh, Benton and Whatcom County are the the big dogs. But you have significant product. You got three percent out of Yakima that's growing. Uh, you got six percent in Skagit. The last time I did this, Skagit was ten percent of the production, but it has not kept up with the rate of growth of Benton and Whatcom County. So their percentage has shrunk. But there's been a lot of new plantings in this. Uh, Snohomish is going to go up a lot. Uh, Franklin County's 2.8 percent. That's going to go up a, a lot. But if you split this by growing region, 43% of production is Eastern Washington, 57% is Western Washington. Interestingly enough, there are 30 growers of consequence in that for these 43% in Eastern Washington. And so what you see, you see there's, a, there's far fewer, but on average, much bigger growers in Eastern Washington and you have the average farm size being a lot smaller in Western Washington. Interestingly enough, 60% of all Washington blueberry growers are in Whatcom County. So just trying to predict something, um, I would kind of ignore these numbers here, um, but this is what I expect is going to be in the ground by the end of 20. 18, um, and I have an estimate, it says it could go up to 223,000, 223 million pounds when, by 2015, when all of this is fully bearing. Now, it's just a, product, uh, a prediction, conjecture, I don't know if this is going to be true, but this is a pretty solid number pretty solid number and if you look at why well, I have it here at 15,000 is the average and nobody in Eastern Washington is doing 15,000 everyone's doing more than 15,000 and 10,000 pounds maybe seems a little low this could be a conservative number it also assumes no planting after 2018 That's what it looks like. This actually goes to 2024. That arrow goes up after 2024. Um, so this is, it's been a pretty linear line. Um, once we get the actual numbers, there's a little bit of curve, you know, a little bit. It's been pretty linear, pretty linear. So that's the production story. So. Uh, what are we doing with uh, the money that we collect from this industry? I just want to point out, um, we our assessment is only eight dollars a ton or four ten cent a pound. This line used to say we had the lowest assessment in the country, but in the last year, the Michigan industry formed a commission and they actually set an assessment that's just a little bit lower than ours because our assessments have because production has increased. And, and we get so much a pound, the, the assessments going into the Blueberry Commission has expanded uh, proportionately. Um, the three big areas we do work in is research, promotion, and export, food safety, and labor. We have a small in-state fresh program. However, the research has been the leading focus and accounts for about half of our assessment dollars. Now, this shows a 12-year history of assessments this line the green line here is overall um, overall funding this is the, this orange line is is research the gray line is administration and I just want to point out the rate of administration has gone up but not nearly at the rate that everything else has gone so we've tried to keep administrative costs low so we can put as much money into programming efforts this line here is uh, export Export, market export development and promotions, and this is this is outreach. I just want to point out that the administrative costs are budgeted at about 19%, but we always are running in the black, never in the red. We don't spend all of our money. Actual expenditures are about 16%. I just want to point out that I get $60,000 for running the, the commission, 
And that's not me getting 60000 That also pays for the bookkeeper, the person that helps collect the assessments. It pays for our, um, like for, for travel and overall uh, running, the, running the commission. And that's uh, flat this year. Uh, it hasn't gone up. Um, particular programs that we do are promotions. Uh, I want to point out that the U.S. Highbush Council that has a much higher assessment than we do and has a budget over $6 million has the official responsibility of doing marketing promotions, both domestic and international. And so they're the ones that have the money. And so they do most of uh, the marketing and promotion work. What we do is we do a small in-state, in-season, fresh blueberry promotion, um, mostly tied around the Seattle area and Seafair and events around Seafair towards the end of our season. We also uh, do some things to support some small growers uh, where we give them some basic promotional materials to use at farmer's market at UPIC operations. We do this all this through a uh, uh, Del Delani Communications, it's a PR firm, and we, we give them $25,000, and we have another one or $2,000 that we buy blueberries to give them to, to pass out, and about 25% of all the growers in the state participate in the farmer's market program uh, that have UPICs, roadside stand, farmer's market uh, stands, and if you were to go to superblues.net, we try and have on there information uh, about every blueberry grower in the state that wants to be on there that does a, a you pick a farm stand or a farmers market and we try and promote them uh, promote their their activities as I, as I said about half of our money goes to support uh, research um, when the commission was formed in 1969 one of the drivers who formed the commission was to do research particularly they were targeting mummy berry and the commission has largely kept that as their their focus and roughly they spend as much money on research as they do everything else combined um, we have a, a very functional very active uh, research committee uh, it sets research priorities, it, it collects the proposals, it ranks the proposals, makes recommendations to the full commission on what to fund. In 2017, we funded 16 projects for $236,000. Um, that was up from $206,000 the year before and $185,000 the year before. So kind of as our assessments have gone up, so has our funding for, for research. It's interesting that the number of projects hasn't really changed because the cost of doing research just seems to be getting more expensive. Um, part of the reason for that, I think, is WSU is providing less support for their researchers, and so they're having to ask for more money to kind of do the same level of, of work. Um, when I started uh, with the Blueberry Commission in 2006, back when we only had 18 million pounds of blueberries, uh, we funded four projects for $17,000. Um, and also, Leighton Overson is the chair of the research committee and does a great job. Um, this is just a list of the projects that we funded this year. They actually rank, the lower the number, the, the, higher, the higher the ranking it got. Um, and we, we're doing a, a work, uh, this is a project that I'm doing, I'll report on tomorrow about fungicide decline curves uh, to help meet MRLs, another project, organic control of spotted and Drosophila. Joan Davenport's gonna be talking later today, I believe, looking at variety specific uh, fertility uh, recommendations. Gwen Holheisel is doing some work on cold hardiness for blueberries. Tim Miller sitting over here uh, testing several herbicide programs and blueberries. Uh, this is work on mummy berries, herbicides, pollination. We're going to have a talk about this, I believe, later today. This is kind of a far out there uh, proposal. This is one of the kind of a little bit further over the horizon. Most of the work that we do is pretty applied, kind of a quick return hopefully the growers will benefit it within the next two or three years this is a project a little bit further over the 
the kind of the event horizon. I'd encourage you guys to come listen to this talk. If Manny Choi, Dr. Choi can pull this off, it'll completely change the way that we are controlling spotted wing drosophila. And we are actually co-funding this project with uh, the Raspberry Commission. Um, I, Lynn Sosnowski um, got my kind of personal honorable mention of the most interesting new project. She is doing some research on filled bindweeds, a particularly destructive weed in blueberries, particularly in organic work, trying to apply some products that are not really conventional herbicides to take out filled bindweeds. Um, there's another project, Organic Control of Mummy Bear and Blueberries. We have a talk. Um, Andy Jensen is going to be giving a talk, uh, I don't know, today or tomorrow about uh, aphids in blueberries. Uh, we have a, a plant breeding talk, a root weevil project, and Tobin WSU's Tobin Peaver kind of moved his lab over from Pullman to uh, Mount Vernon, and so we gave him some money for some equipment. And so you can see here the uh, money that we spent, the who's getting getting the the money, then the institutions are from, and the projects. So another area we work in is export, working on export market developments, Washington, U.S., Canada, North America, South America, just the entire Western Hemisphere is producing more blueberries every year, and we think that exporting is one of our ways out of this, and we are particularly well suited to do this around the Pacific Rim. We're closer to Japan, uh, closer to Seoul than any other blueberry growing state. Um, Oregon already has fresh access to South Korea. Uh, we want we want that as well, and so British Columbia, Oregon, California, as well as Washington, have developed aggressive export market programs in the west coast all on the west coast the bc and oregon washington california are much more export or export oriented than the rest of the u.s and so we have kind of teamed up to try and force the u.s uh high bush council to do more work in this area right now the u.s high bush council has projected um increased efforts into exports and have projected that that it's hard to believe but u.s blueberry exports will remain flat for the next five years and we're trying to get them to change that mindset and so but this is an area that I, is one of my my biggest areas of, of frustration we feel that one of the highest priorities is develop export markets and we have teamed up with California a joint project to try and get in early to South Korea, Vietnam, a number of a number of countries, and this isn't the whole list, but this is our 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 big list. Um, we hope to ship to South Korea in three years, but two years ago I said that, and I don't know that we're any any closer. Um, this is the area. If you were to look at the sh sharpest increase of any of those lines, it would be in export market development. Um, is, I don't know why this says, is just on, but we're doing both processed and, and fresh. Um, California is only trying to work on fresh access. We're working on process and, and fresh. But it's very difficult for a state to open up an export market. Um, Oregon did it with South Korea, but it's otherwise exceedingly unusual for a state like Washington to be able to make this happen. It's basically... It needs to be a nation-to-nation -nation effort, um, and that's why we're trying to push the U.S. High Bush Council uh, to put more effort in export market development. But opening up new markets takes a lot of time and money and energy. <clears throat> we are teaming up with Oregon for a, a trade mission to Vietnam and the Philippines because we, <clears throat> we expect Vietnam and the Philippines to be opened up for access to blueberries in one to two years. Um, after this meeting or after this talk, we're going to be talking about uh, some ideas that that the Blueberry Commission might be uh, might want to work on. One of the things we're looking for is 
we have some money that we want to put towards export market development, and we're looking for some ideas on things to do. The Food Safety Modernization Act, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. One thing I do know is that there's going to be a lot of changes, and almost nobody in this rule room knows about those changes. The young lady in the front row from the Department of Agriculture uh, is going to help us with that. Uh, Henry and I are meeting with her later today. Uh, we're planning to team up uh, and offer some FISMA training. There is some mandatory training required by 2018 with enforcement starting in, in 2019. That's There's some change coming, and I'd like to tell you about them, but I don't even understand all of them. Uh, so we are going to get together with the Department of Ag Food Safety Specialist and figure out some training. Um, it's a you have to have eight hours of training, and there are some very specific requirements. Not just anyone can offer this training. It has to be people with certain credentials that are hard to come by. Do you have that special certification? You can do it? So you can be the lead trainer? You, you cannot be a lead. But they have to be in the room, right? You have... Okay, if you've got it covered, then we're going to have it covered. So I don't know all the details on this, but every farm is going to have to take this eight-hour course. And so we're going to set up a series of training sessions and offer the training to folks. But the bottom line is you got to show up. And they have this system rigged where you have to pay a stupid amount of money to get this mandatory training. Somebody is making a lot of money off of it. I think it's Cornell University, but that's a whole nother story. Also, uh, Washington State is going to require paid sick leave for farm workers, actually for all employees, and there's some other new rules. Again, I don't have my hands around this, uh, but it's something like you have to give, after so many hours of working, you have to offer so many hours of, of sick leave. I don't know the details, but again, we're going to try and provide some training about these, these rules. <clears throat> As I keep mentioning, uh, and the numbers keep showing, our industry is rapidly evolving. I want to go over some, just some, just some issues. Um, here's some concerns that I have. Um, Washington now produces more blueberries than any other place in the United States, and it is liable to continue, and it doesn't really matter if somebody produces more than, than, than we do. That's not really the point. The point is we produce a lot of, of blueberries, but when you look at our participation in national organizations, we're, we're not there. We're the largest producers of, of blueberries, and we have the fewest members. At, we have less than 10, 10 of our growers are members of the North American Blueberry Council, we need to have more representatives on the U.S. High Bush Council. We are not exercising the influence that we, we should be. I, as I've already mentioned, I don't feel like we're making enough progress on opening up export markets. Uh, I'm just thoroughly disillusioned with the Small Fruit Research Center. Um, we're not getting much out of, out of that organization. Uh, imports aren't aren't helping us. Um, um, imports are up a lot. Mexico is really starting to come in and uh, into our, our marketplace. And the thing that kind of disturbs me for the first time is uh, we saw the first imports of processed blueberries out of Mexico. Um, often I'm less concerned about Washington because Mexico has not come into our market during the fresh season. But if they start processing blueberries, they will, they will impact us. The other thing I want to mention is watch out for, for Peru. Um, I, I say I presided over the demise of the Washington asparagus industry. I also run the Washington Asparagus Commission. And we went, our industry collapsed by 70% in just four years uh, due to the imports from Peru. Um, and they're ripping out asparagus and everything else and planting blueberries. I'll tell you how big of a deal it is. Fall Creek started a new nursery just for Peru. And they've, they've opened up, you know, Fall Creek, Peru. And they can produce blueberries any time of the year. Now, they've got favored times, 
but where they're growing, uh, there's, there's no disease, there, there are no blueberry insects, there's no weeds to, to speak of, and um, it's where, where they're growing it, there's no rain, there's no rainfall, so it's all, it's all irrigated, it's all sandy soil, they, they put in chick manure, and then plant blueberries in there, and uh, they get some very, very high, high production. Here's another concern that I have. Our state continues to plant blueberries. So I didn't have permission to be on this farm. I kind of drove up to the edge and kind of drove in just a little bit and parked. I didn't get out. But I took a picture out the left side of my truck looking one way. They're laying plastic here. This is the one that's uh, all organic being planted for the processed market. Um, and... You know, it took Washington 60 years to get to 100 million pounds, and it, from 2014 to 2024, we're going to increase another 100 million pounds. Um, this is the picture out the other side of my truck, and so I could park this one place, look both directions, and I could not see the end of the field either direction. Um, and, you know, a lot of the production that's coming on now is from outside money, hedge fund and other, other kinds of, of money. And when that money is in and pr pushing production, the economics change. I mean, this is a company that's coming in, it's money out from back east, coming in, planting a lot of, of blueberries, and they're going to put up a plant. And I'm worried about whether we're ready for things like this. In 2016, there were growers who ended up with no place to take their fruit. A lot of reasons for this, but basically it comes down to increased supply. And buyers take cheapest, easiest, closest, um, avoiding small growers or people that are not certified, uh, food safety certified. Um, when it comes to third party certified, we have growers that aren't GAP, even GAP certified, uh, but it won't be too long before just being GAP certified is, is not enough. And so growers are going to have to make it easy for buyers to take their fruit unless you're marketing it yourself. And so uh, you should know now, right now you should know who's taking your fruit next year because if you don't know where your fruit's going next year, you're in trouble. So that's the less positive aspects of the, the industry. Um, so, you know, the price is not as good as it was. Okay, that's not quite written in here, but 2017 price is better than 2016. The inventories are down. That should bode well for 2018. We'll, we'll see. Another thing that I'm really happy with in our industry is, is this show. Um, uh, uh, WSU, Chris Benedict, Henry Beerlink, and the Blueberry Commission uh, put, put this meeting on. Record attendance every year. I don't know what, we don't know what the attendance is this year, but they had 350 some people pre-registered and they expect over 100 people to come in and register. So we're going to be over 450 people. Um, I just think it gets better every year. I don't know why I like it that they rotate this room by 180 degrees, but I, I like it. I mean, it's just every year they seem to tweak it um, and, and make it a, a better. The only concern I have is um, we're maxed out. So what happens if we get to 500 or 600 or 700 or 800 people? Um, but anyway, Di Diane O'Neill who uh, Chris Benedict, Henry Beerlink, and their staffs are, are doing a, a great job on this. Also, we have started, you know, workshops. Um, we have one in Eastern Washington, one in Skagit, one in Whatcom. We've done pruning, food safety, pest management, irrigation, whatever we think we need. Chris, do you know what you're going to do this year? Ambush question, never mind. Uh, but anyway, um, we, I give these guys money. I, I said, here's come up with what the best topics are. Here's some money. Here's a workshop. And uh, we're doing a lot of research. We're paying for a lot of research. And so hopefully we can push that information out, out to the growers. Another thing is um, I work really well with the Washington Red Raspberry Commission. There's no two commissions in the state 
that work as close together as, as we do. Uh, you might think that the Hop Commission and the Beer Commission work pretty closely together, but not nearly as close as what uh, Henry and I do. So that's uh, we we really work well together, and that's um, I think good for good for the growers. Our strongest suit is is research. We fund more research than any other state in the in the in the country. Um, um, uh, Dr. DeVetter has developed a strong horticultural program. Uh, we got Tobin Peaver in no time created a strong plant pathology program. Um, we've got a number of other folks that are contributing to uh, our research base. I just want to tell you that these research projects take time. Uh, sometimes these projects don't always end up with useful results and it may frustrate folks when they hear proposals or hear presentations and they came up with, I didn't find anything out useful, but not all research works out uh, every, every time. But we think that the projects we have are addressing our highest priorities. We've had a researcher that submitted a proposal that we didn't like, and we said we're not gonna, we're not gonna fund this researcher, but we worked with this one to form the subcommittee to come up with uh, some a research problem that we, we wanted funded, so it addressed our issues of, of concern. Um, one of the things I'm hoping to do is to get, we have a plant pathologist that's supposed to be serving the Pacific Northwest, Virginia Stockwell. We have not been able to get her to do work on blueberries in Washington, but that is one of my big goals for research is to have the uh, Pacific Northwest Small Fruit Research Center pathologist to do work on blueberries in, in Washington. We have overall the latest plantings in, in the country. We have the youngest average aged fields in, in the country. So that means we have the latest, the, the best varieties, the best technology. Uh, we have, the, our plants tend to be newer than other places. Um, so we are well situated. Uh, we have some of the highest, if not the highest yields in, in, in the country, particularly in Eastern Washington. We have the most organic production in the world. We have very good growers. We're in an excellent position. If we ever can get these markets opened up, we're in a very, very good position to do exports if we can open up some markets. I wish the U.S. could be more like Canada. British Columbia has done an excellent job on opening up some export markets. Another interesting thing is we have the widest range of harvest. We harvest, we ship blueberries, fresh blueberries from June into October. No other state does that. No other growing region does that. Now, I will tell you that Peru is going to have a wider range than we will eventually, but right now that is a, a strong suit for us. Uh, some of our people have some deep pockets for funding. Sometimes that's not always a good thing, but there's a lot of money back in our folks. And everybody is wanting to move into Washington and grow or get access to blueberries in Washington. We have folks coming in from, from Oregon, down from Canada, up from California, and we've got money coming in from the East Coast to put in facilities here. And everybody wants our, our blueberries. So our assessments are $8 a ton, and we have no plans to change our assessments as production increases. So will our budget. So we will have more money in the future than we do now. Um, we right now do not have any plans to change our policy to have most of our money going into research and export market development. But with investments in these areas, we need to increase the amount of information to growers. Um, something that would be terrible is if we funded a lot of money in the research and then we didn't communicate that to the growers. Um, so this is going to be a, an area of emphasis for us. But we're seeking more involvement and more feedback and more participation from industry members. Um, we have commission meetings and usually it's the board members and just a couple people. <coughs> And so one of the things that we want to do is after I'm done with this talk, which is about over, we're going to have a little bit of like a listening session and we're going to try and solicit input from
from the audience about what they want to what they want the Blueberry Commission to to do. Um, but in doing this, I want to explain something to you all. The Washington blueberry industry is really diverse, and that's our one of our biggest source of strengths, but for me, it's one of my biggest challenges. We have a fresh and a processed industry. So right now, we're 30% fresh, 70% processed. 43% of our production is Eastern Washington, 57% is in the West, 25% organic, 75% conventional. So we have like six kinds of sectors to our industry. And so one of the things that I'm challenged with was how do we balance the interest of an east side organic fresh grower with that of a Whatcom County conventional process grower? They have different pest problems. They have different, so many things are, are different. It's sometimes hard to juggle all of those interests. If we were New Jersey, where all the blueberries are growing right in one spot, in this Hamilton, just, just in a 30 mile radius, all the blueberries are in one spot. Or even in Oregon, where most of them are just right in the Willamette Valley. It would be a lot simpler. Um, um, so that's one of the challenges that, that we have. So when I hear Daryl saying, you send the assessment forms out too early, um, if I send it out right before his harvest, there's other people that would be finished with their harvest. Um, so, so there are some, some challenges. And one of the questions that I have and we have is, you know, is it time to rethink what we're doing? Should we be doing things differently? Are there things that we're uh, missing? And so we're, we want some input from, from you. I just want to point out, this is the line I showed earlier. We have been generally, when we get the assessments in between now and January, we develop our budgets for next year. I look at that and say, well, we've got you know $500,000 in money, so half that's gonna go for research. And then we take another percentage and put that into export market development and a certain amount into these other programs. And the question is, should we be doing other things? Um, should we be doing things besides research? Uh, should we put more money in export market development? And um, and right now we spend twenty five thousand, well twenty five thousand plus two thousand for in state fresh promotion. And are we really affecting change? Are we really influencing demand for Washington blueberries by putting twenty five thousand dollars into a marketing program? Um, you know, it's like what are we missing? Is there more of something should we be doing? Should we be less of something? Should we be doing something new? I'm throwing ideas out. Should we do training in, in Punjabi? You know, probably 40% of the uh, blueberry growers speak Punjabi, although I personally have not met any that don't speak English, but I'm just throwing that as an idea. Should we have a lobbyist in Olympia? I run the Asparagus Commission, and we have a lobbyist that work on state issues in, in Olympia. Do we team up more with British Columbia or Oregon or California, or do we try and not work so closely with them? So the question I've got is what should the Blueberry Commission be doing to address our industry concerns? So it's, it's time for questions. You can ask me questions about my talk or if you guys want to throw some ideas out about what you would like to see the Blueberry Commission start doing, stop doing, or change doing, now's the time. Daryl, you had your hand up. A little bit brain dead. Uh, uh, thinking about planting blueberries when, when uh, uh, the, the amount of blueberries that's in the ground right now is uh, probably the tonnage is going to quadruple. Quadruple. The only uh, savior to this thing is that the quality of, uh, of the health food that blueberries are, uh, as selling at a low value, will move a lot of product. But it doesn't mean that that, 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 that a lot of the growers are going to get rich from it. I would I would tend to believe that a, a person should end up. Bigness is not the name of the game right now. Tom. Uh, 
Uh, Alan, do you find these, these larger outside money operations coming in, do you find them harder to cooperate with? Are they kind of their own separate entities? It, every farm has its own personality. I, there are small farms that are locally based. They're difficult to work with. There are large farms that are difficult to work with. It, and then there are small farms that are easy to work with and large farms that are easy to work with. Um, it's, I don't think that size has anything to do with this. Um, AgriCare, big operator and biggest grower in Oregon, uh, that's outside money. And I, I work a lot with those folks. Um, so the answer to your question is, is no. Just to follow up, it's one of the things that I can see as a danger of all these larger operations getting going is that the smaller growers, they, they save their knowledge as part of their value added and the smaller growers have, are at a disadvantage. And I think the commission should kind of fill that gap as much as possible so you just you just laid it out there that is I, I sent a when I went out and took pictures of this farm that was being they're being groomed to plant for next year um, I took some pictures and sent it to my board and one of the things I said was what how do we meet the needs of these folks and people that have also have 10 or 20 or 30 acres. Um, everybody pays assessments, and so everybody deserves support from us. And so we can't, it's, it would be unfair for us to preferentially support programming activities for small growers and not do it for large growers. So we need to do programming activities for everybody. Now, maybe we take a certain amount of our money and, and try and do food safety training for smaller growers. Maybe there's other kinds of research. Act I can tell you, we have some very, very large growers. Uh, I mean, like really big growers that pay a lot of money. And I talk to those growers specifically and say, what kind of research projects do you guys want done? And we make sure those research projects get done. Chris. Okay, this is a question for Prosser. <clears throat> Could you take a bit more time to talk about export markets and what Oregon did to increase their export market? So, a very long time ago, when I say a long time ago, I'm going to say it's been about 15 years, they filed some paperwork or somebody filed some paperwork um, for Oregon to go in. And then they waited about 10, 11 years for that to go through the system. And, and Oregon got in. And we've, we've been told after later from USDA APHIS that there'll probably never be another single state going in. There might be a growing region to go in. But it's widely, widely considered to be a, a one-time deal that's not to be repeated. They got, in a sense, lucky, although... They made their own luck and did their own application. But I also tell you, um, to in the case of Oregon, uh, be careful what you you wish for. Um, my counterpart for the Oregon Blueberry Commission told me that had he known what it was going to take, he would have gladly handed or, uh, South Korea to us. So I look at what they got and say, I want some of that. I want to be able to go into South Korea. But the amount of work that the state of Oregon and the Oregon Blueberry Commission has done has been staggering. Normally, the cost of, because when you first get into some of these countries, they, they make you do a lot of inspections. And normally, that's spread over a country and the national organization. But one of the reasons that Oregon doesn't participate with us in California in some of these export market developments is almost all of their money for that is dealt with South Korea. And how many million pounds do you think they've sold to South Korea, Tom, in a year? Have they sold two million pounds? More than, more than two million of fresh? 
No, probably not. I, I don't know that directly. I probably shouldn't. It, it hasn't been as big it. of a deal. Um, so anyway, Oregon, Oregon got lucky with that one deal. We are trying to do a carve out where Oregon, Washington, California can get in earlier. Uh, to, we got some agreements with USGA that we might be able to get in earlier. Um, and so we're, we're, we're working on fresh access to, to China and to South Korea. Um, and we also expect before South Korea and China to have fresh access to the Philippines and the Vietnam. I don't know if that answers a question from Oregon, but if you want to send in a, another question, please do. Alan, I got another question for you. What do you got, Daryl? Uh, that I need. Uh, see, I'm I'm very heavily in, involved in the GA uh, GAP uh, and the food safety. But what we really need as a grower is to get a publication that kind of really spells out what uh, where we're going with this, so that the, all the farmers are understanding it. Uh, uh, rather than uh, whether it's HACCP or uh, GAP or, or uh, a, a new program that, that uh, the government decided they wanted to place on, on, on us. Jill, do you got, any, got anything? I, mean, I need this to be explained. So I'm Jill Weishart. I'm from WSCA in the Produce Safety Program. And we are looking at having trainings for growers across the state. And what Alan was talking about was maybe some very strategic trainings for blueberry growers, blueberry and raspberry growers. So we'll bring the curriculum up here to y'all. Not at this conference, but we're available to come up. Uh, but also in the meantime, check out the Produce Safety Alliance website. They have an amazing amount of resources for you to refer to. Sure. Okay. So I made a note of this. Um, so some written materials for, for food safety. All right. That's a, that's the kind of thing that, that we can do. Um, question in the back here. Uh, mine isn't a question. It's more of a comment. Um, Bring it on. So I'm a direct marketer in Snohomish County, um, produce about 80,000 pounds a year, all you pick. And my observation is that as an industry, one of the areas we could pro provide more support to our industry is in helping create a better public relations image in the state. Our voters are so far removed from agriculture that they approve new minimum wage laws that greatly affect us as an industry and them as a consumer, but they don't even understand it. Um, I think that there's a great opportunity for us to influence public perception as an agricultural industry. We're considered very um, highly credible with our consumers, yet we don't take advantage of that opportunity. And I wonder what we can do. This is a commission or whether it's Farm Bureau or other parts of our industry should all be working in Olympia and within our communities to help influence the public and their voting perceptions. And I wonder, does the commission see that as an opportunity or not? Okay. Here's what I got. Last year, we set aside, or it'd be this, this year, 2017, we set aside $5,000 to do uh, a video on a topic. And it's a little complicated, but we couldn't come up with what we should do, what topic we should do. We did one before where we looked at just like blueberries are, are great and some environmental, environmental stewardship things that we do that we, we put out in 2016. We were going to do something in 2017. We right now are trying to decide whether to do something like some kind of promotional video or promotional information and, and put it out. So you said better public relations influence public opinion. If that is, again, that is something that we can do. We, we got the, okay. We got the people, we have the, we have a PR company. We give them the money and we'll, they'll do it. Let, let me just expand on that. For instance, um, I worked with, I'm a pumpkin farmer on, as well. In fact, that's what I primarily do. I host about 80,000 people a year on my properties. I share with my employees that there's 80,000 opportunities a year to influence the 
community around us. We went to Olympia last fall and we helped push through Senate Bill 5808. It's a liability limitation law that allows direct marketers and um, agritourism operations to protect themselves from frivolous lawsuits. We were very successful at, down there doing that, but it is an opportunity that you know we created that the rest of the state can take advantage of. I think there's more opportunities like that, and I just you know whether it's it's not specifically blueberry messaging, it's agriculture messaging, and there's an opportunity to partner with other parts of the industries or other industries. All right, give me your card afterwards. You may get on a committee. All right, um, Chris, what do you got? Okay, go over here, John. I just wanted to uh, affirm your encouragement for North American Blueberry Council and U.S. Highbush Blueberry Council and a greater involvement. And I would just say that Alan's been at the meetings faithfully, but uh, truly the center of the industry, those organizations were founded much more when the industry was Eastern focused or Southern focused, but the, the way that, uh, kind of the way things work, you've got to attend meetings. And uh, just attending the meetings and that will come appointments to committees and appointments to the council. And I would highly, highly, highly encourage that. We need to have this input from the Northwest in those areas. So this is, this is how I feel at those national meetings. Historically, blueberry production was New Jersey, Michigan, and Oregon. And that is historically where the power was. And if you look at who's calling the shots on millions and millions of dollars of assessment monies, it's heavily based out in New Jersey, Michigan, and, and Oregon. And I feel like I'm showing up late to the trough trying to feed out of it. And I'm trying to elbow my way in and um, getting some bloodied elbows sometimes. But it's something that I, I can't do myself. And we need to have more people show up to this, at these meetings. And in 2019, Washington is hosting this meeting. And I'm hoping that we will have a really big attendance of Washington growers Again, it's not till October of 2019, but we need more participation at the national level. Chris, Benedict, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, sorry, it's from Prosser. <clears throat> okay, so Alan, what do you think the commission should be doing? What are your personal thoughts on that? <laughs> okay, the, there's a bullet point I glossed over where I said the, the board gives me pretty, I don't want to say free reign. They give me a, a long leash uh, that they jerk once or twice a, a year. And so the, the board is doing kind of what I want to do. I'm, I have a bias towards research and a bias towards export market development. And um, um, so we're, we're doing what I think we should be doing. I also know that I don't have a lock on perspective and, and ideas. And my concern, it, we're doing what I think we should be doing. I think we're doing a good job. But I have a feeling that if somebody else were in my shoes, they might be making some different decisions. Or because I think I'm doing what we're supposed to be doing, maybe I'm close to other ideas. And so we're doing what we should be doing. I'm more concerned that what am I missing? And so we got about five minutes left to give me some input or buttonhole me in the next couple of days. So someone else, raise your hand. What do you got? Hey, we have Eastern Washington non-blueberry grower standing up. Hi. Um, so I'm a, an asparagus grower from Pasco and the asparagus industry in Washington state is, has been having its lunch ate by yeah. okay. a little closer, Jeff, the, the asparagus industry in Washington state is, has been having its lunch ate by central and South American competition for years. And that continues. Uh, so, you know, it, it, blueberries, stands that threat i would take it seriously and maybe look to work with other industries like asparagus to to maybe change the regulatory environment that's allowing this to happen
Five minutes left. This is your chance. Give me some feedback all the way down. Hi, all the research that you do, is it easy to get a hold of the results? I, I don't normally go to the meetings. I'm kind of a small grower, but I like, I'm like i really interested in what's going on. Are there summaries or are there, or you just got to come to meetings like this? Or? One, one of the challenges we have about getting information out is um, how, do we, how do we distribute it? We, we can prepare a written document. Um, um, one of the concerns we have is if we generate this data and we put it out digitally, then everybody gets it, not just people in, in Washington. And so we, we balance out how to distribute this information so it, it goes to benefit the people who paid the assessments as opposed to people who don't pay for the assessments. I can tell you that anybody that wants any research reports or wants all their research reports uh, can contact me and we will send it all to you. Be careful what you wish for, but we can send it all um, to you. And, and we can do it electronically or we can do it in a, in a written format. So I'm gonna just give me a second, I'll make a note here. Okay. What you, John? Uh, regarding Peru, uh, I think one thing we haven't talked about today is uh, flavor, repeat purchases, how berries taste. And I will tell you personally about uh, six weeks ago, there was a significant number of containers of Peruvian frozen berries that were at stake. The sample come in and the customer turned them down because they didn't had no flavor, no taste. And one thing that I think clearly Northwest berries have, you definitely have better bricks, definitely have better taste. And like I said, I'm not sure about asparagus, but I think that we've got to learn to to sell a lot of the intangibles of, of the product uh, today that we haven't had to sell. Uh, well, the intangible of antioxidants is what's grown the industry, but we've got to start selling other intangibles right now as well. We, we, we always felt that the flavor of Washington asparagus is better than, than Peruvian, but part of that was it took longer to get up there. Ours was always fresher. Um, um, that did not make a difference in a process one, but we decided to do some opposition research and try to come up with some things where we could trash talk their asparagus. So we went and got asparagus from different locations and looked at the level of antioxidants in it. And we found that our asparagus uh, had significantly more antioxidants than theirs, presumably because theirs took longer to get up there and degraded over time, but maybe for some other reasons. But when we decided that that was actually self-defeating to try and ta trash talk the health benefits of their asparagus versus us, and it would just, anyway, that's a, a tricky one to do, but I can tell you um, anything that we can do to set ourselves aside, quality flavor would be to our benefit. All right, someone else? Chris. Uh, just a comment from uh, a remote site that basically, uh, the comment earlier about um, public outreach is, is important, but to be careful to not engage in lobbying, um, which is not allowed as a commission expenditure. That sounds like a Department of Ag board member talking to us. Um, there's ways to do outreach and education that doesn't violate the rules. What we have to be careful of is that the commission does not take an action that is in opposition to the position taken by the governor. As long as we do not do something in Olympia that is in opposition to the governor, we're okay. All right. Going once. Last question. So, <clears throat> not so much a question, but Regarding the the differentiating your differentiating yourself, um, I went through a similar thing in the, in the salmon industry, um, fishing in Bristol Bay, Alaska, and in 1995 to 2001, farm salmon pretty much destroyed our our industry, and the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute refused to. Uh, 
to do any negative ads against the farm salmon because they figured consumers wouldn't tell the difference and bring the whole industry down. <clears throat> but um, we went; we, it crashed anyway as our price went from two eighty a pound to thirty five cents a pound. Um, and since then, they've figured out that um, pointing out all of the positive attributes of wild salmon, people, and the consumer can tell the difference. And I would take. Um, every chance that you have to differentiate and point out the good points of, of our blueberries compared to any competitor. This is a complicated topic. Um, all of the money, the real money for promotion and marketing is at the national level, the U.S. High Bush Council. They have a $6 million budget. The U.S. High Bush Council takes money from the Chilean industry and does marketing on behalf of importers, of importing countries. So it's differentiating ourselves is going to be difficult if our industry takes money from imported blueberries and does marketing for them. That's presumably they're doing marketing during windows for in, in their windows, but this is a tough subject, but we're out of time. We need to stay on schedule. So thanks for coming and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you, Alan. Now we're going to take a 15 minute break. After our break, um, we're going to begin talking about pest management in this room here and in the small Fall Creek room, they'll be talking about pollinators.